a lot of us say that, oh yeah, we listen to our customers. A lot of us say like, oh, we love our customers. You know, we often hear things like, oh, the customer is the most important thing. But when you really boil it down, how well, you know, do you really know your customer, right? I think I think a lot of people can't, sometimes cannot answer this question properly um, because one of the things I remember um, at when my first company, I worked at Shred, um, the CEO would always say, um, if I don't know the name of my top 20 customers, and if I don't know their birth date, and if I don't know what they are into and what they like and who they are, right, then I don't know my customers. And we are live with a new episode of the CVO Live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CVO Live. I'm here with Ronak Shah. Hello, Ronak. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, and, and uh, I'm excited to be here. It's my first live, so really excited to do this. <laughs> Let's do this then. So uh, before uh, going further, let me uh, introduce uh, you a bit. So Ronak is the CEO and co-founder of Abvi, the winner of the Entrepreneur of the Year at uh, EY 2022. Uh, he's also featured in uh, Inc. as one of the 22 high achievers. He, he grew a direct-to-consumer brand like this, and I'm really, really excited to interview you today, Ronak. Thank you so much for having me again. Uh, it's it's been a, it's been an honor to be in this space, and then I love uh, the ability to be able to have a platform to share my story. Superb. So first of all, let us know for the the ones which are not familiar with your, uh, your with your entrepreneurial journey, how how you've started it, how 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 was the idea, and how you've decided to to build this brand. Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, um, I was supposed to always be an accountant. Um, I was an accounting major. Uh, my dad's an accountant, and uh, that was the path I was supposed to take. Um, I got the opportunity to become a controller um, at a startup supplement brand back in 2012. Um, so I was an accountant at Deloitte, and uh, I, 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 through mutual friends, got the opportunity to work as a controller for a startup supplement brand. And I took the risk because, you know, when you're an accountant, you can always come back to becoming an accountant, but you get very few chances to kind of work on a startup. Um, so I still did accounting work there, um, but I absolutely fell in love and was fascinated with the idea of building a brand and starting up a brand and working crazy hours. Um, the brand I used to work at, we used to work two shifts a day. Um, so it was an intense amount of work, but um, I got to see a company grow to about 100 million uh, uh, and uh, back in 2012. So I was only 21 years old. So a lot of great exposure. I stuck to it. I said, uh, you know, I, I, I want to get into startups more. I want to stay in the health and wellness space. And I want to see if I can one day have my own brand. But till then, I'm going to learn as much as I can. That's, uh, that's amazing. So let's, uh, le let's understand a bit about the, how, how that experience uh, framed your reality afterwards. Because you, you've been seeing that this, is, uh, th this, can, this can grow, right? So basically, you've, you've destroyed some limiting beliefs. You've also installed other, other beliefs. How was that? How, how Absolutely. Was um, I, think the, I think one of the biggest pieces that I've, I've, I've realized and learned um, is that when we're, when, when, at least from when I was focused on you know, learning about startups and wanting to understand that this is what I want to do, I think one of the biggest pieces I learned is the whole world of startups in itself is is a completely fascinating experience. Like, you know, you 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 can be in accounting, but you need to know marketing just as much. You can be in marketing, but you need to know accounting just as much. And I loved how close all the networks were to each other. And I found that to be one of the most fascinating things for someone like me who asks a lot of questions. Excellent. So. Uh, yeah. Why this vertical in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, when you look at this space of, of being in, you know, um, in startups or, 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 or D2C or e-commerce or whatever it may be, one of the biggest things you realize is 
needing to know your customer is so imperative, right? And it's, sometimes it's very hard to know your customer um, if, if really, you know, it becomes tough to understand, are they liking the product? Do you see the results? Do they give good feedback? One thing I loved about health and wellness is you can quickly know if they like your product. You can quickly find out if they see results from your product. You can quickly find out if this brand is going to be scalable because it all depends on the product. So I loved being in a vertical that can, where you can experience and understand feedback very quickly. Fantastic. So uh, to to set the stage a bit, you've made something truly amazing. If you because we have this access to more than three thousand brands, we we see how much revenue they they generate throughout the years, and you've made you are now at forty million yes. uh, US dollars in only four years of existence, right? That's correct. Yeah, we we crossed a, a little over forty million dollars um, this year. Um, and it's been it's been a great journey. Uh, we're also only a team of eight people, so that part is pretty uh, awesome to know. You know, you don't need a massive team um, or raise a ton of capital to do it. Excellent. So tell me tell me a bit about the customer research. So you are talking my language. I'm also a former e-commerce entrepreneur. Then I got sidetracked to the software as a service. So I I, I do know uh, a bit about it. So. Tell me how you are doing customer research because the whole uh, mission of our uh, uh, event here is to help companies improve customer lifetime value by knowing their customers better. Right. Um, I think the, the, the one thing that we said when we were going to start the brand or, or even just when I've been exposed to customers um, is... A lot of us say that, oh, yeah, we listen to our customers. A lot of us say like, oh, we love our customers. You know, we often hear things like, oh, the customer is the most important thing. But when you really boil it down, how well, you know, do you really know your customer? Right. I think I think a lot of people can't sometimes cannot answer this question properly um, because one of the things I remember um, at when my first company, I worked at Shreds, um, the CEO would always say, um, if I don't know the name of my top 20 customers, and if I don't know their birth date, and if I don't know what they are into and what they like and who they are, right, then I don't know my customers. And I think that stuck with me always, which was we need to have, we, we will never know every single person by name, by heart, everyone, right? But if we can know some of them or majority of them or interact with them at some point, that was very important. And that's why we created a community. Um, right from day one on Facebook. Um, it's why every month we go live on our community. It's why we do so many surveys. Um, yes, we have to sell the product. Of course, that helps run a business. But if you don't know your customer, um, your business can only grow so much um, and you will only have so much of a relationship with your customer. So for us, knowing the customer, literally knowing them, and I know the names of our top 20 customers, I know their birth dates, I know where they live, I know what they do for fun. So that was very important for me. And uh, the, to, to, to set the, the, the stage a bit, Ronak, how many customers do you have in total? Because it's important. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah, we, we have a, a little over 350,000 customers now. Um, <laughs> And so I try to maintain the same level of respect of trying to get to know as many of them, especially all the ones that come in the community. I try to I definitely get to know, but it's hard. It gets harder as you grow. But I think if we stay consistent, uh, people still at least appreciate your attempt. Fantastic. I love it. And I want to unpack something, uh, something regarding your, your top customers. In, uh, in our methodology, applying the, the RFM, we call them the soulmates. Like these are the ones that by, has the, have the highest recency, frequency, and monetary value. By knowing them, by knowing why they are buying over and over again, you can tweak your marketing and you can understand what kind of products to, to put in your, uh, in your offer. Uh, let me know a bit about your uh, your approach to your uh, top customers absolutely um so for us with our top customers we what, what we let them kind of feel is we tell them that they're building obvi with us okay so when when we reach out to them to do a survey we don't tell them like hey like we're just looking for this uh, results and we'll give you like some gift card right to finish it we tell them guys hey guys we're trying to figure out the next product we want to launch for obvi you guys are our core creator group. 
You guys are our core customer base. You are our loyalists, our VIP. Um, and so we want you to pick what comes next, okay? Um, a lot of people use the words like VIP and like um, exclusive and all that, but they never really mean it. For us, we've done a really good job, I think, of exclusively making certain customers feel very special. So our top customers, they're almost treated like royalty. They get to pick the next product that launches. They get first access at anything we launch before anyone else, almost a week to two weeks before. So they have the product and they're already trying it before anyone else can buy it. Um, they also get um, a completely different messaging through our email and SMS. Like when I say completely different, like they know secrets about our company that like we don't put out in the public. Right. And so it's really, really special for us um, to have this kind of association with them. And it's very easy to do. It's like almost imagine your top customers are like your best friends. OK. And like yeah. if you if you have your best friends like and they were all in a group chat. OK. We have a WhatsApp group chat with our top customers. Right. Imagine you have um, a group chat. What would you talk to them about? Right. Like, hey, guys, it's, ugh, today's a Monday. Who's feeling it? Right. And we'll say stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Or like, hey, guys, don't remember to take your burn today because I know all of us binge ate at, 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 at uh, Thanksgiving this past weekend, right? Like little things that you just try and talk to them normally and it helps us associate ourselves to, to, the, to them. Excellent. So I I just showed uh, a bit of uh, of your website and uh, I love that uh, that you have this uh uh shop by uh by health goal so how you came up with these uh, goals because many many companies are just bombarding uh, their customers with some product names and they are not looking what's the product for you know it's like uh, like when, when you are uh building a new product with a new uh name it's all about what's the path you know what's the bridge what's the product taking you towards what kind of desired uh, uh, outcome but i want to unpack a bit the process of deciding these are the four goals that uh, we're going to mention absolutely so when we're when we're looking at the goals or even how to market to people okay one of the things that we realize is Sometimes there are people who go out and know what they want and they search for that. Okay. Those yeah. are the people that honestly, you don't even need to market to because they're already in the market. Okay. And so what's going to make them sell, what's going to make them buy something is typically price and then maybe aesthetics and maybe flavor or taste in terms of differences. Okay. And so, you know, I think we do a good job there. Now, the other side of the spectrum, are the people who don't know they need something, but are open to looking into it, okay? Or, or open to having some intent and understanding. Yeah. Those people really um, are, are, are the fun people to, to, to kind of take down this journey because you don't have to worry about them price shopping you. You don't have to let them worry about uh, looking at too much competition. You just have to do a really good job at selling them on why they need something. OK, so when we created our four goals, OK, we wanted to make it so clear to let people know that, OK, here is this product set that will give you anti-aging. Here is this product set that will take over your daily essentials. Right. When you think about daily essentials, you're thinking about vitamins. You're thinking about. So that's our multivitamin. Right. When you think about weight loss. Right. We want you to know that this is going to help you burn fat and curb appetite. Right. Anti-aging. We're going to take care of hair, skin and nails. Right. So. When you look into each of these four categories, it is extremely important to let people understand right from the beginning within, they always say within the first five words, people should understand what you're selling, right? So yeah. within our first five words, you know exactly what could be interesting. And then what we're hoping is you pick a funnel and you go down that funnel, right? So as soon as someone clicks on one of those, now we've captured that piece of data on them. Now, even the uh, abandoned cart email we sent to them, even the, 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 the pop-up or the remarketing ad we sent to them, they're completely structured around <laughs> that funnel. 
It's like it's like you are following our methodology. So, so Ronak, I want to share this because we have this. The CVO methodology takes into account the first party data, the zero party data. It it it's allowed. It's about the jobs to be done with the products, and then by tagging the customers, you do remarketing, you do onboarding, you do reactivation based on the fact that you know that the goals are around anti aging. And I love that you we're we're speaking the same language. Uh, and and coming to the same uh, same understanding of it, yeah. And I think again, it's brilliant what you guys have created too, because it's like what wh why data is important. I think sometimes people try and try people sometimes make it too much around the fact that like oh, data is 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 like trying to take someone's um, information or data is trying to email people. Data is actually trying to refine what someone needs versus what someone just gets to be have to stumble upon right um i i really like what somebody said once um this whole privacy stuff that happened right ios and stuff like that it's not like you now don't get to see ads anymore right if you opt out of privacy what you're opting out of uh when you when you let's say block data or don't want certain pieces to get your data is you're opting out of things being filtered better for you right by teaching uh, by teaching people by letting people get data on you so that they can uh, the, the system can learn better so i love i loved um what you guys are doing too because it's like it's letting people get more targeted um uh results of what i see on an advertising and then an, and and a brand like us using a service like it which is getting more people who are interested in it so i think i think that's the future of data I love it, and I uh, I totally agree with you, Ronak. And uh, being here in Europe, it's a it, it's a totally different game, and uh, it, it's all about having from strangers having known visitors, and then from known visitors having uh, customers, and then repeat customers. So the funnel is is suddenly way way longer when you yes. when you have this uh, this hassle on uh, right. uh, on your plate. So I wanna. Uh, shift a bit the, the the gears here and and to uh, tell us a bit about your process of making sure that the customers are happy or are satisfied or that you are you are closing the loop because that's also a big component of our uh, of of our understanding in the cvo we have three pillars we have what you sell which is the most important the product what you say which is the marketing and what you do which is the customer experience all of them yep. are important, but without the product, you have no business. So uh, uh, also in, in a high competitive market, customer experience, it's also important. So tell us a bit about uh, how you handle uh, customer service, how you are making sure that the customers are happy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, um, great question. Um, there's a multiple layers for us too. Um, number one, once we... Um, get somebody to become a customer from the moment they're a customer. And I'm talking about from the moment they see the thank you page. Okay. We are instantly getting them excited and geared up and ready for the experience, which we call the Opti journey. Okay. Um, and throughout this journey, okay. I'm talking about from the post purchase, thank you page email all the way down to delivery. Okay. I'll, I'll start with that part. We're actually already starting to collect feedback there too. In, in Mitzer Journey, we tell them, here's what to look out for. Here are some tips and tricks. Join our community right away um, so you can talk to other women just like you. Then we ask them, we want to know, what got you excited about buying Avi? Was it just the right price? Was it somebody else that told you about it? Was it a great ad that got you excited and, 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 and you love the flavors? Um, so we ask them a bunch of stuff. Right there, we're getting feedback. Okay, we're getting an understanding on why somebody wants something, okay, or why somebody bought something. You use that to do more of what worked, right? So um, that that's feedback point number one. Then we ask them to come into the community and introduce themselves, okay? you When they're introducing themselves, we ask them to give us feedback on what is something they struggle with in their life and help, okay? So we find out a lot of people struggle with diabetes keto friendly, like a lot of health problems. Okay. And yeah. so then we know, okay, we got to use this as feedback to make sure we cater more of our ads to this. Okay. Now point of delivery, right? From the delivery to day seven, we get a lot of feedback on, Hey, do you, uh, have you been enjoying the product? How have you taken it? Do you, 
mix it with milk? Do you do this? We do a lot of feedback surveys. So just right there, right? I'm talking about from the minute they purchase to 10 days after delivery or seven days after delivery, we've talked to them three to four times already. Okay. Um, and just collecting on feedback on what they're doing and why they're doing. It, okay. So I find that to be very helpful. Um, so that's, that's number one. And then secondly, now let's say somebody has had the product for 30 days. Okay. So then we start the journey of, have you been enjoying it? Okay. We want your real review. We want you to send us a video, negative or positive feedback. We even, we actually ask for videos for negative feedback. Um, we then also um, obviously ask for reviews, simple things like that, Trustpilot, um, Yotpo, um, our review yeah. system. Um, and then lastly, I think one of the most core pieces that we do is we ask each of our customers if they would recommend to a friend, okay? And if they say no, then we ask them a series of questions of why not. If they say yes, we take them down our affiliates journey which is growing this community of now 65,000 women, right? That's growing a massive pool of revenue, but also a lot of referral revenue, which is great. So I think we're talking to our customers at least seven to eight times in just the first 30 day journey. Um, and each point is collecting feedback on why or why not they would continue down this journey. So fantastic. I'll stop rambling there, but I uh, hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I love it because it's uh, it's it's such a uh, it's basically re refreshing to see that uh, people li like you are actually uh, uh, applying this uh, the, this uh, tactics and uh, having authentic relationships with the customers because without opening your ears more than your mouth, all you are doing is uh, shooting in the dark, and there there are many brands which are simply struggling to survive while they have good enough decent products but they don't know how to nurture these kind of relationships and i want to touch a bit on the subject of uh, customer lifetime value acquisition retention customer journey how you are what are you monitoring so what's important for you which are the north star metrics that that you're after uh, and that are guiding your decisions yeah um i would say up until probably two years ago, um, what we cared about was brand level retention, okay? And what I mean by this is, you know, you can call it customer lifetime value, but I think that's a, sometimes it, it becomes a little um, gray area, but what we look at is brand level retention, which means are, we, are you coming back and buying from us, period? We don't care if you're buying anti-aging products, detox, we don't care if your first purchase was weight loss, we don't care if your first purchase was collagen. Are you coming back and buying more product from us at least five to six times in your lifetime? Okay. Um, and, and retaining yourself with the brand. What we switch to slowly um, is we started to go towards customer lifetime value by SKU, which is if you're buying our weight loss product, the burn, okay. We want to make sure you're buying that at least five to six times again. And if you're not, we want to figure out why are you dropping off? Why are you churning on that product, right? Why are you jumping to another product? Are we doing too much cross-selling? Are we to have too much confusion? We want to understand when you stopped using it. Um, and then lastly, we want to understand, did you see results or not? So when we shifted towards customer lifetime value by SKU, it's we've become, it's almost like each product now is its own brand. And we've been able to become way more refined, way more kind of um, predictable in what we should be expecting. Um, so that's now our North Star metric is what is the um, um, customer lifetime value by certain SKUs. And yeah. uh, that's definitely our, our, our top one. Excellent. So I want to show you and our audience uh, something that uh, we've we've uh, we've launched last year, which was also eye-opening for us to 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 be able to see 
what is the lifetime value by the first bought product like here and also to see the chances to place the next order at the uh, based on if the first product uh, was this or uh, uh, or the other so i think we're speaking the same language oh, that's this incredible. is that's great yeah that, that's uh, that's How do you something you guys figure out the chance to place a second order is that based on just obviously historical only or are you using any other data there yeah we're predicting based on the uh, based on the purchase but that okay. let's say this is of course dummy data but we have data from many customers uh, yeah. based on that we are coming up with the chances to place the next or next order and based on that you can prioritize and also what is something really important is that this is guiding your budget so you can bid differently if you know that you have a certain sku that's delivering a, i don't know 1100 in clv it's a totally different great game if it's uh, delivering only 500 uh, in uh, in clv so based mm -hmm. on that you are you are uh, truly data driven Got it. And then can people upload their data and you can run historicals on it too? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we grab data from Shopify, from BigCommerce, and then we, we push this data. And the, the beauty of it is that uh, to, to, to brag a bit about our latest uh, 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 capacity. So basically, based on that, we, we can build audiences. Like if this is a certain product or if you have a last order, uh, first order by a certain product or by from a certain RFM group. So let's say you have your soulmates, which are the best ones. You can build this as a, as a, an audience and then send it wow. to Facebook, to Google ads, and basically to run, to continue the journey. If they are at uh, in a danger zone and they've bought a certain product, it's like an email, but on uh, Facebook ads. And also we connect this with, uh, with Clavio. That's, uh, that's our uh, game plan at this moment. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Really, really cool. Yep. So, Ronak, I wanna uh, I, I wanna touch on a uh, on a different subject regarding the how come you've started to to ask to 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 use the surveys. You know, I, I'm a huge fan of surveys, and let me give you the backstory. You know, I was an e-commerce entrepreneur. My friends were working in multinational, corporate, whatever. I was. Uh, burning a lot of money on Google Ads. And that was in back in 2012. So back in 2012, imagine uh, having a business, we were making something like 7 million or 8 million in uh, revenue. 1 million goes to Google Ads and they were always mocking the fact that, man, you're an, a Mr. Entrepreneur. You don't have money and you also, you don't have time. What the fuck are you doing there, you know? Yeah. And yes. thanks to that struggling moment, I've started to look at uh, the data and I was, wasting my life in Google Analytics on the visitor behavior. And after some moments, I realized, you know what? I need to look at the customer data. And I had no option. I've started to do these SQL queries, whatever. And then I've decided, you know what? What if I can ask the customers why they are not buying again? You know, yes. what, what was their experience? And for us, it was like these months of analysis on the Google Analytics mm -hmm were nothing compared to a freaking survey that I've yep. triggered and I've got the answers from 500 customers or, or so. It's fascinating. It's, um, it, it's like, you know, when you, when you look at how we've been traditionally been thinking about behavior and customers and everything, we're always all taught to like, okay, do this and persuade customers and, and, three, four percent or five percent of them will buy, right? That's the typical conversion rate. Yeah. Um, and and we we all just say, okay, yeah, sounds good. I'm at five, six percent, my business is good. But like what boggles my mind is 94 to 98 percent of customer of, of visitors don't buy. Yeah. And yet we are so and of course you need to be focused on making sure uh, we can keep increasing the conversion rate optimization on 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 the people who do buy. But what about like just understanding why so many people aren't buying, right? And and why like what's why are people in? You're never going to get 100 percent of people to buy, right? But why is the bar so low of just needing four to five percent people, right? I understand that's what makes a healthy business if you make your if you make the numbers work, but like how how is that how is that the bar like why is it so low right if people are clicking on something that is so targeted why is the bar so low and I, that always boggled me so i always wanted to 
look at it the other way and say, let me just ask. Let me let me understand why people don't want something um, and see if I can cater to that in the next run. That's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, tell, tell us a bit about some aha moments that you got thanks to, to the surveys. We, I'm a big fan of surveys, of conversion rate. Of course, we have the whole product around conversion rate optimization besides this one. But tell us a bit about some aha moments. Yeah. So one of the ones were, um, it was pretty, pretty awesome. I don't think too many people know this, but um, we have now 34, 35 SKUs. Okay. We launched with two SKUs. Um, the other 33 SKUs that we've launched till date, they are purely driven and decided by surveys. <laughs> so every single SKU, like our third SKU, we didn't have much money, okay, when we launched when we wanted to launch a third SKU. So we basically initially we were like, you know what? We can't screw this launch up. Okay, we can't waste money. Why don't we just ask? the 250 customers we had at that point, why don't we just ask them what they want as the next flavor, okay? And at least maybe if, they, if they're if they telling us what they want this, maybe they'll buy it. So we we, we, um, launched, uh, we launched a survey, we put five flavors, we said, hey, pick pick the next flavor, and then we'll, we'll run with that. Initially, the only reason we did this survey was we, we just didn't wanna mess up the next launch. But what we realized, is when you actually just ask people what they want and then you deliver on it, the burden shifts to the customer to be like, oh shit, they listened. Like, <laughs> I, I like, I have to buy this, right? Like you, you almost are putting obligation on back to the customer and it was so fascinating for us. So we said, okay, on our fourth product launch, we did it again, fifth, sixth, seventh. We're now, you know, 33 more launches later, every single product we've launched and will launch ever in the history of this company. We will do it via survey. We will ask them what they want. We will take it to R&D. We will uh, produce it and then we will launch it and we will hope to see the success we've seen thus far. Hats off to you, man. It's a, uh, <laughs> it, it's a fantastic, uh, it, it's a fantastic uh, piece of information and uh, what I have to what I have to say is that uh, we I'm writing a book my my book around the CLV revolution. I hate it that I've just sent it to press because I I would have caught you at, at the section of how impactful it is to use uh, and leverage surveys in your uh, product uh, assortment. I and I, that I think it, it's it's not even like it's it's important. I I just feel like more people need to do it. Just you know point blank. Um, and then um, the next piece, the one other aha moment I had, uh, which I think was really powerful through survey, is um, in our surveys, um, one of the things that we did was we asked someone, we asked people, tell us one other product that you were considering, uh, one other company you were considering to use before Obvi, okay? Yeah. And we would get lists of all of these competitors we've never even heard of, okay? <laughs> like random, maybe like MLM brands or random brands. And we said, okay, this is now, we took the list. I think we have like a list of like 62 or 63 companies. And we watch them like a hawk. We see what they're doing in marketing. <laughs> we see what they're doing in their community. We see everything. And what it, what it has turned into is it's become our ecosystem. Okay. And a lot of times you think you know who you're competing against or who your competitors are, but sometimes you have no idea. There are ones that aren't even out here in the open, right? And they're just doing TV marketing or they're doing podcast marketing and you never even heard of them. So it was fascinating to find out our competitive landscape through our customers. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic insight. Uh, what I want to touch right now, Ronak, is the fact that sometimes you are not competing with the product. Sometimes you are competing with another habit of, I don't know, maybe sometimes you are competing with uh, a weighted blanket, you know, maybe you are competing with some other products or with other habits, you know, other behaviors. And unless you unless you know the problem that you're you're solving you don't know how to write copy and that's also something that i've discovered uh, uh, i was doing this job to be done research for a 
for a company two years back, a, a direct consumer company from from the UK, they were selling uh, turmeric shots, some something around your your uh, area, you know, and they they realized that they were selling uh, immunity support, more energy, whatever, and they realized that their recurring revenue, so most of their the recurring revenue, like sixty percent, came from people which were looking to get rid of the joint pains. So basically it wasn't their brand around energy, immunity, whatever. It was people that were buying turmeric because it was a fantastic replacement for ibuprofen and other uh, uh, other things that were harming them. You know, the side effects were yes. really damaging against their uh, natural components. And through their feedback, through their uh, direct uh, open answers, it was like these guys are writing our ads. You know, it's like <laughs> we can't do anything else. That just put them over there. It's not. That's it. There, That's there's it. There's nothing to add. There's nothing to add. And I and I think it's like we we I think sometimes when you put yourself as a marketer, you feel like you have to have the full burden on. You feel like you have the full burden on why on how and why you need to market a certain way, but sometimes you have to shift the burden on the customer and have them tell you what part of the marketing that you did is what worked, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think sometimes we just try and say, like, we do all these post-purchase little surveys that say like, what, 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 where did you buy from? And people just click Facebook or TikTok or whatever. We need to go deeper, right? Yeah. What, what, what is the reason you bought this? What are you trying to solve? Right. And I feel like we don't ask that because we think it's too intrusive. But on the flip side, we're trying to put everything in spaghetti at the wall and hoping something works. Let's might as well ask them. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. Uh, Ron, I want to I want to shift a bit towards the 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 business uh, strategy. So how you are making the culture, you know, because it's not only you, right? You are customer centric. By I mean, you are one of the most customer centric uh, CEOs I've ever encountered. And kudos for that. I'm really happy that we're doing this Appreciate together. Uh, how you are making your team think the same that you that you are? How are you instilling this to your? Maybe you are working with the agencies or to to everyone to to focus on. We don't know. Let's ask the customers. Let's follow yeah. what they are saying. Yeah. Um, I think one theme we have across the company between my founders, myself, and our, our employees, um, and even when we, when we have our uh, weekly debriefs with agencies, one thing is, is if anybody does not have an answer that they're willing to bet on, okay, that they're willing to put their money on or put their job on the line for, right, then you need to go and find the answer through qualitative data. Like for us, and, and like even if some, someone, we, we might even have a, a, um, an employee that's like, I know chocolate covered strawberry would be such a great flavor if we launched it, okay, for collagen. And we, our first time, even though that sounds like a great flavor, we'll say, um, how, how do you know that? How do you know it will work, right? And unless there's data backing anyone's answer, um, we don't we don't go forward with it. Now, the negative part of this mindset is that we don't let gut or instinct come in the way or feelings or emotions. Um, we're very cut and dry there. We, we it's, it's everything needs to be very data oriented. So if you already have a suggestion or you have um, a thought or you have something you want to try or test, um, even those things need reasonings or purposes or, or number driven qualitative data to say this makes sense to try or test or do or launch. So I think that part is just in our day to day conversations, in our day to day, like even meetings, our agencies know that like it's just the theme. So it takes out anyone just saying, oh, yeah, I'm just trying this out. Uh, there's no casualness um, in it. And again. It, the negative of it is it takes away sometimes the fun of trying yeah. something that is so bizarre, but uh, we, we just can't afford to try things. Love it. So, Ron, regarding your, uh, uh, your next adventure, so how, how you are, uh, what's your vision around AppV? 
how you are making this vision happen? Yeah. Um, so the next, I think the next piece to Obvi is um, we need to grow in retail. So we're launching in Walmart in August uh, nationwide, which we're excited about. Um, but more importantly, um, Walmart is just one of many places that we need to be um, available. Um, and so what we're focusing on is um, building out a, a team in retail, also getting some strategic partnerships and advisors to help us grow the retail arm. Because with D2C, you can build a great brand, you can scale well, and you can make tons of money. But if our vision, which is we want to have a nine figure exit to a strategic uh, buyer, um, we need to hit some serious scale yeah. and critical mass. And that will only come um, through uh, retail developing the right way. Yeah, this is in line with the, what many people in the direct consumer arena are, uh, are stating that you, the, there is a plateau and you can't simply scale and the unit economics are not working unless you are distributing through, through, through retail chains. Yeah, and it's not even plateau. I think what happens is, is um, you get to a point where you can't keep LTV going for so long. Right. The, the reason mm -hmm. it's called lifetime value is there's a lifetime of a cons customer. And, yeah. and if that customer is churning at some point, you need to be scaling at, at, at exponential levels year over year over year over year. OK. To keep um, the, the pace of growth yeah. uh, that you would need. And, it, and it's an immense amount of, of pressure on advertising spend and acquisition to do that. I uh, now that we're here, Ron, tell us about how you uh, do you monitor uh, lifetime value versus customer acquisition cost? Do you do this type of dance? Tell us a bit about the CAC payback. Give some insights because there are still many uh, entrepreneurs, e commerce leaders, which are guided by ROAS or other shallow metrics. Yeah. Um, I think. Um the, 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 the guiding metric for us is not the CAC to LTV ratio. The, the reason CAC to LTV comes up is we know when we want to sell the company or raise a round or a capital or anything, we know we need to hit a three to one, right? It's what everyone tells us. Uh, we know that's in the back of our mind. We're probably around two and a half, two and a quarter, two and a half to one right now. So we know our metrics well. We know it's not good enough yet. Um, but I think what we measure is by funnel, we measure what our CAC is. Um, but more important than CAC, we measure what our new customer acquisition cost is, right? So and NCPA is the most important metric for us outside of uh, customer lifetime value by product. Um, NCPA gives us a good gauge on a few things. One is what are we really willing to afford? What do we really have to pay? Uh, to get a customer, what, um, what, how is the market working? How is the e economy trending? Because almost all of those layers affect NCPA. Um, and so for us, NCPA is almost like um, a NASDAQ ticker, right? Um, we don't change too much. So when we see fluctuations like this in NCPA, we know something's going on. Um, and so it's a great measure for us to understand volatility. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the closest metric we look at outside of CLTV. Love it. Uh, is, is there uh, any other, uh, let's say, method that, uh, that you, you want to share regarding uh, increasing lifetime value? So we, we mentioned basically monitoring it, monitoring it by the SKU. Uh, using surveys to make sure that the customers get what they want, tagging them to follow them and to, to do this type of uh, flows and journeys based on what they are sharing uh, uh, with you. I is there any other technique that you, you want to share with us? Yeah, um, I think one thing is, is make, make purchasing easier for your customer. Okay. Um, and, and I think what I, what I mean by that is like, we feel 
pretty strong about the fact that like once somebody buys on your website, right? Obviously, you know, there's intent, you have to now follow up with them, blah, 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 right? Um, when it comes around to their second purchase, okay, or third purchase or fourth purchase, you should have enough data points on your customer through surveys, feedback, through uh, initial purchase behavior, revisits, remarketing, et cetera. You should have enough um, feedback or and touch points on your customer to be able to then step in and say, hey, here's what I think you should buy next. Here's the offer. Here it is. One click checkout, straight to checkout, go, right? Uh, we even went and, and worked with TapGuard to create an app because so many of our customers retention-wise, they know what they want, right? So we said, all right, you know what? Why do we make you go to a website? Why do we make you type in a website that when you know you know what you want? Here, go on the app and just buy there, right? Um, and so we think about ways to make things very easy um, and, and, and get the thinking out. Subscription is another great way um, to do, you know, uh, increase customer lifetime value. But I think what it boils down to is if you think about if your customer is ready to buy again, okay, how easy do you make it for them to buy again, right? Do you remind them enough? Do you only do promo emails and promo SMSs or do you even remind them on the value? Are you doing enough blogs? Are you on top of their mind every day, right? Um, and then are you striking at the right time? With the offer are you making the offer so good that they're ready to check out right away are you taking them straight to checkout right are you preloading all their information in checkout so that they can use shop pay or they can use uh, afterpay very easily um all of these pieces are so important and you can't miss on any of them love it diminishing the friction is uh, is a big component which can be a deal breaker even though you have the intention you have the motivation but then you have to log in you have to remember the password you have to add it again in the cart and then you have to right. whatever so i i uh, i totally agree and i love i don't know if you are using uh, uh, tiny habits from bj fog so basically you 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 are mentioning the 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 behavior model from from him it's about motivation ability and the prompt right so when you are doing the the, the timing nailed it um uh, yeah I also wanted to ask you something regarding the days between the transactions. You have different SKUs and they have different purchase cycles. Yeah. So basically maybe the anti-aging is not being consumed as fast as the immunity support or whatever. So are you, uh, uh, are you analyzing this? Do you, do you have uh, some plans to calibrate the reminders for non-subscription uh, customers based on that? Yeah, what we do is um, post-purchase, uh, we do a lot of following up with our customer. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually ask them, like, um, have you been taking the product every day? Have you been taking it every other day? Have you been only taking it on weekends? Do you take it on weekends? Based on that, that data feeds into what flow delivery. Um, and it helps us because so if some if a group of people who bought this product all say, oh, I don't take this product on weekends. We replicate the flow. We have one flow, but we replicate the flow that would basically kick out the um, um, uh, repurchase reminders out by eight days because they don't, they skip weekends, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have people who are like, oh, I take it like here and there. Then we have another flow, we're same flow, but the kick out days are kicked out an extra 20 days. Right, because we assume that they're probably skipping two to three days a week. Um, so there is ways to capture the information on when your customer and how often your customer is actually creating a habit and 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 focused on consuming your product. Um, and we feed that into that data into when the flow should go out instead of just putting everyone into an all-in-one solution. Love it. Yeah, it's uh, it's so eye opening, and uh, I hope whoever is uh, listening or watching this episode, you you better you better listen it again because there are some incredible uh, gems over here. So so thanks for sharing this with uh, with us, Ron. Uh, going further, uh, I wanna 
I want to focus a bit on the uh, ways that you are crafting this customer journey. Do you do anything of like uh, package inserts or like things like that? We have we have a lot of customers which are going outside the digital whatever, yeah, because the the uh, unboxing is has the one hundred percent open rate, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so for us, um, we got a little bit kind of, um, sorry, one second, uh, we got a little bit tired of, um, sorry, we got a little bit tired of the whole idea of inserts and no offense to anyone who's doing it. Yeah. Um, we just believe everyone's doing it. So how do we be different? Okay. Yeah. So inserts typically cost anywhere between seven cents to up to 25 cents, depending on your volume. Um, we went and spent 39 cents and created a booklet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this booklet is 10 pages. It's a six by six booklet. Okay. It has recipes. It has dosage guide. It has join a community QR code. It has a page with a coupon, like a, a cutout coupon that you can scan and use on the app. Um, it has a reminder to, to um, uh, leave us a review. It also has all the other stores we're available in. It's literally a book um, and it's, it's stapled. It's like a stapled uh, paper book. Um, yep. But this book, it's amazing because people are reading this and they're finding out we have more products. We have this and that. Inserts and all are great, but you, let's be honest, we're, we're going to be extremely transactional on those. Yeah. Uh, we're maybe going to drop a QR code. People already are looking at them and they just throw them like this, right? So our first time purchase gets a book. Our second time purchase onwards gets a magnet, okay? The magnet sits on their um, fridge. fridge. Now that's a reminder. Now the brand is a billboard on your fridge, right? Um, the magnet costs us, I think it's like 28 cents. Um, so all of the costs are higher, but the utility is way higher and the throw in garbage rate is lower. No one throws out a magnet, you know, um, yeah. and no one throws out a nice looking booklet, right? You're probably going to stack it up and keep it. So, um, we, those are the two big things we do. We see an immense amount of click through on our QR codes on those. Um, I say spend an extra 10 to 20 cents if you can stomach it. Um, I know when people have low margins, it's tough, right? Like, cause that's 20 cents per order. If you have 10,000 orders, that's an extra two grand, uh, of lost profit. So I get it. Um, but, um, the value is immense. Yeah. I, uh, I want to ask you, Ron, re regarding the, this type of techniques, do you measure the, it's clear that you've measured the impact and you've seen the impact in the retention rates and in the. Uh, purchase frequency, but you are mentioning something very important and I want to focus a bit and unpack a bit the, this technique because it's, I also have it in my book. We have a lot of uh, success stories with, with, with this. Many people are throwing their discounts and are bombarding their customers before they had the habit of uh, consuming the product, before seeing the value. There's no discount that is going to convince me to buy again a product which I haven't mm -hmm. seen the value from. So uh, I want to unpack a bit the, the fact that the fragile moments, the most important moments are not from zero to one, if you've nailed your conversion and acquisition, but are from one to second, the second to third order. And there the chances are always, always going higher. So we have this yes. data, huge amount of data. Yes. First to second, second to third, fix this. And then it's like a domino effect, right? It is. Um, I, I think. I think the 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 big piece. So, for to answer your first question, yes, yeah. I measured it. Um, I measured it mainly because when you send out inserts, um, we didn't see that many clicks on our QR codes. Um, one, number two, um, we never saw anyone post about it. Like people would do their unboxing, and we literally saw people look at the insert in their video because we asked for a lot of UGC, okay? Yeah. So this is literally saw and we say, don't open your box until you do the UGC, okay? We want it to be super organic. We literally saw people take the, the packaging out, look at the insert, toss it, okay? Mm -hmm. And like, this is for UGC content, so they're being as organic as possible, but also, you know, trying to like it. Um, and um, anyway, so 
when we saw that people were like, okay, just not too keen on it, um, we then started putting these booklets. And the booklets became a stopping point before even the product. And that's yeah. when you know if you can capture attention before the real deal, now you know you've gotten someone hooked. Okay. So I think that piece is very important. And then on the zero to one to one to two comment, I think it's it's really important to like treat the first time purchasers versus the second and third time purchasers completely different. Like they almost need to be catered to like a different company atmosphere, right? The first time purchaser, they're around excitement and you're trying to bring them into this, uh, this world of yours. The second time onwards, these people, like they need to be, they need to almost be congratulated on the fact that they've stayed consistent, that they've yeah. made it this far, the tone, the messaging, like, hey, now this is a staple in your life. This is a magnet on your fridge, right? You should be proud that you do this every day, that you have to be reminded about this. You know, um, it, it's like when you put a kid's drawing up on a fridge, right? So I think there's certain things we, we do that is supposed to attack the emotion of, of someone. Fantastic. Ron, I think we could go for, for hours, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately we're running out of time. Uh, I think you, what you're doing is amazing. You're a, a natural uh, uh, tap into uh, art trading customer journeys. I think it's amazing that you've done all of this in only four years. I've been uh, investing my, let's say, from 2012 up until today, so 11 years, I'm doing all these things. So basically you've touched a lot of the things that I've learned by learning, by working with the D2C brands like yours, really hats off to you. Thanks a lot for being today with us in the CVO Live episode. And I wanna make something, uh, if you agree, uh, we wanna get you again in a few months from now, and we wanna do this as a part of the CVO Academy. So I think Absolutely. your knowledge, belongs to the CVO Academy, our 16 hours uh, Academy, but you're a practitioner, which is actually doing this. We have there the chief evangelist from Clavio. We have uh, prof academic professors. We have people, but I think what you're doing is amazing. And I'd love to, to, to build a, uh, a course based on what you have to share. Oh, I'd love that. I, I really appreciate it. I will say out of, I've, I've done a lot of podcasts. I've done a lot of different things. Um, I think some of the questions you asked just shows um, um, how in depth even you've thought about these things. Cause it's uh, you don't just use the word retention. You don't just use the word, uh, you know, repeat purchase. You're actually trying to understand how those things happen. Uh, and I think we need more of that. So again, thank you for, thank you for the opportunity, the platform. Uh, I hope everyone got some value and uh, I would love to be a part of, of, of what you're continuing to do. Perfect. That was all. Thanks a lot, Ron, again. It was amazing to have you here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. If you've listened to this episode, make sure you listen to it again because uh, that was full packed with the uh, wisdom nuggets. See you on the next episode of The CVO Life. All the best from Bucharest, everyone. Take care, guys.